Hey, welcome back. This is the third and final portion of session 23 on failure criteria. In this part, we're going to discuss what is probably the most famous criterion used for determining failure in ductile materials. And this is considered to be the maximum distortion energy criterion, or the von Mises, or the Henke, or the Hoover, or Maxwell, or uh, who am I forgetting? Hoover, Maxwell, Henke, von Mises. I think that's those are the those are the four. Okay, and it is an expansion on what we've discussed previously with Tresca. So there is this idea of maximum shear stress, and it is quite effective. And in fact, Tresca is safer. Okay, and we'll get into this a little bit later than von Mises. Von Mises is, is theoretically grounded in distortion and is, it, it, it's great for ductile materials and it actually gives you a little bit more of an envelope of failure to work with. Well, here, here we go. The concept for maximum distortion energy is applicable to ductile materials and can be traced back to Huber in 1904. It's also known as the von Mises yield criterion, or you might see it as the Maxwell Huber Enki von Mises theory. And it's based on strain energy density. So if you if we go back to writing out a stress strain plot, and we say, I want to think about specific energy associated with the the loading in a uniaxial loading, for example, we can take a look at the area under this this curve. Okay, and this will, and you can go back and you can take a look at this. This will give you kind of this energy quantity divided by the the volume. Okay, and the concept behind, or another concept to, to keep in mind here, is that the material is undergoing a change in shape and a change in volume with elastic loading and we're storing elastic energy when the material within the material when it undergoes loading and the hydrostatic loading so we're sigma 1 sigma 2 equals sigma 3 okay we do not have failure okay so that means like if you take a rock and you drop it in the ocean it goes all the way down to the bottom of the ocean and this is a ductile rock. Maybe we should say a piece of steel or something. You drop it, it goes way, 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 way down okay, into the ocean. You have hydrostatic loading, pressure from all sides keeps building. The material will not yield. Okay, It will not distort and will not fail. So only when we have distortion do we say that we have failure. Okay, So that means that we need these principal stresses not to all be the same. And we, we won't get into this really, but this has to do with um, octahedral planes and you know, looking at situations where um, there's a balance of stresses on these planes. But don't, don't worry about that, okay? Really, the thing to keep in mind is that we're dealing with distortion and we're looking at the energy associated with distortion. So we start with strain energy. U equals one half sigma epsilon. And if we are looking at a triaxial stress, a state of triaxial stress, we can say that U is equal to the falling, all right? We're not saying that sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three, or epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three, have to all be equal. No, 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 right? We're just saying, remember, we can define a state of triaxial stress in 3D for any situation okay often it's planar that we're dealing with okay so you know sigma 3 epsilon 3 uh, or sigma 3 is equal to zero um, epsilon 3 could be affected though um, but if sigma 3 is equal to zero then we don't we don't care okay but this is the state of triaxial stress where you can have right you can still have distortion right it's when these quantities, sigma 1, sigma 2, for example, are different that you have distortion. 
Then we can go back to stress-strain relationships uh, for material properties using Hooke's law. And we can say that epsilon 1, okay, so if we think of a principal strain now, can be related to sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. Okay, so saying, hey, epsilon 1, if I have stress in the one direction, then I expect there will be strain in that direction. If I have stresses in sigma 2 and sigma 3, I'm going to have negative strains in that direction related to the Poisson, related uh, through the Poisson ratio. And now we can write out 1 half sigma 1 epsilon 1, okay, this term right here, in terms of an elastic modulus, in terms of a Poisson ratio, in terms of sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. And uh, also we can write out uh, how they, uh, so we have um, our original sigma 1s, right? And now we've plugged in epsilon 1 there, right? And we do this not just for sigma 1, epsilon 1, right? But this is expandable to epsilon y is equal to epsilon 2, epsilon z, right, is, up, is equal to epsilon 3. So when we do this out, that substitution, we get the following for the specific energy or the strain energy density. It's, it's a little bit messy, right? And this is a little bit messy, right? Don't, don't worry. I'm not going to ask you to derive on an exam, but we're, we're just going to go through a few slides, a couple more slides, and, and the derivation to get the idea of how we predict failure from distortion energy. So this is the same expression we just wrote. We can also think of the hydrostatic components of stress, right? We said that hydrostatic loading does not cause failure. So we could think of a state of hydrostatic stress where it's given by the average of sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. Okay, so that's, just imagine that, that's like a cube with just sigma average on in, in three directions with uh, zero shear stress. The distortional components of stress, though, can be thought of as, okay, what is sigma 1 relative to an average or the average that we've calculated here, right? So if sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 are all the same, then distortional components of stress will all be equal to zero, right? So there'll be no distortion and, well, no yielding according to this criterion that we're defining. But if sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 are different, then there will be differences from an average stress, okay? And we can think of these as distortional components of stress. So sigma 1 distortional, or sigma 2 distorted, or sigma 3 distorted, okay? And we said in the past that yielding only comes from distortion. So what do we do? Now we go back to the strain energy expression. We plug in these distortional components of stress and we define a new energy, strain energy, that is due to distortion, okay? So this is now the strain energy due to distortion. When we plug in these values into these and do some substitution, we get the following, okay? And uh, there's this new that comes out, okay? And this, this component here, so now, this is the strain energy due to distortion. Who cares? Well, we, we do care, okay? Because what we can now do is say, oh, if my failure is because of this, this, this distortion, and it's because there's a lot of energy in the material that's associated with distortion, if it's greater or smaller than some threshold, maybe I can predict whether there's failure or not. So if I had the triaxial state of stress and I plug in sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 2, or sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 appropriately, and it's if it's above some threshold, boom, I have failure. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And what do we compare it to? Well, we can say, hey, there is a case that I love where I know I have failure in ductile materials. That's the uniaxial loading case. The uniaxial loading case, right? 
So that's where sigma one is equal to a value. What is it equal to? It's equal to the yield strength. So sigma one is equal to sigma y, right? Sigma two and sigma three are equal to zero. Okay, so before we do that though, I mean, that's, that's how we're gonna determine the threshold of distortion uh, of uh, essentially um, um, the, the uh, strain energy due to the, the distorted or distortional um, strain uh, stress component, sorry, we can think of well, what, is, what is the distorted stress due to um, uh, uniaxial loading, okay? So strain energy, strain energy due to uniaxial loading, all right, is by plugging in a sigma uniaxial, right? And so this comes out um, uh, as we as we see here, right? So sigma one comes in twice, um, sigma one, sigma one, right? Two times sigma one squared or sigma uniaxial squared, and so this is going to be the energy, right? This is the specific strain energy associated with that sigma. And if we plug in sigma y, okay, and we say two, this is three, this is the same exact equation that we have here, but now we're saying, we know, like it was saying a second ago, we can know this case where we have failure in ductile materials under uniaxial loading, and that's when the stress that we apply is equal to the yield strain. So now we can say, look, here is a strain energy due to distortion where we know failure will happen. This is cool. That means if the strain of energy that we calculate for a more complicated state of stress exceeds the strain energy under uniaxial loading when you have yielding, there will be failure. So failure results when the strain energy due to distortion is greater than the strain energy due to distortion when using uniaxial loading and hitting the yield strength of the material. So what does this mean? That means that we can set these two equal to each other and do a little manipulation and come up with what we call an equivalent uniaxial stress. What this means is take you know, whatever principal stresses you have, plug them into this equation, and now you have the equivalent uniaxial stress. So you're going to compare, we're going to compare this uniaxial stress to the yield strength of the material. And if the equivalent uniaxial stress is greater than the yield strength, then we have failure. Okay, this is cool, right? What we've done is we said, look, we can calculate the distortional or the strain energy due to uh, distortion, and we can say, oh, there's a case where I know it fails, and that's under uniaxial loading, and then we can compare kind of more complicated states of stress to that uniaxial loading case where we have the yielding. So here's some takeaway formulas. Right? This one, put it on your formula sheet, okay? If you have the triaxial state of stress, you can figure out an equivalent uniaxial stress that you that we can map to the yield strength of the material. Here's another one that's really nice. Okay. This is the equivalent stress for the general 3D case. So this with this formula, you don't even have to calculate the state of triaxial stress. Okay. And this is it works for 3D, it works for 2D, right? In 2D, you're gonna have tau yz and tau xz. Zero, you're going to have uh, sigma z equal to zero, right? You're going to be dealing with sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy, right? Just those three components. And so now we can calculate the equivalent stress very easily. I mean, it's easy in that it's one equation. It's not that easy in that it's, I, I mean, I'll make mistakes, okay, on this. Getting the right numbers in there, but maybe you program it into your calculator. Maybe you use Colab, right? There is a, a, a Colab example one for this particular session so that um, you and I can do this math correctly. Um, and another thing, okay, is that if we we go back and we look at this uh, the state of planar or plane stress, right? So if we come and we look at this equation right here, 
and we square, we say, okay, sigma uni x goes sigma y, and I'm going to square it, and then I'm going to get this stuff over here. So I get sigma y squared, and I have a sigma 1 minus sigma 2 squared. I have this sigma 2, I have this sigma 1. It comes out, this is the equation you get when sigma 3 is equal to 0. Okay? Sigma 3 is equal to 0, and we have sigma y as our uniaxial stress. This is the, this comes from, you know, this comes from the distortional energy theory, all right, that we've described up to this point, and it's kind of a nice, succinct condition. What does it say? It says, well, we're going to have failure if this equation right here, sigma 1 squared minus sigma 1, sigma 2 plus sigma 2 squared, is greater than the yield strength squared. And this is another way to think of the von Mises criterion when dealing with plane stress. So let's do um, an example. Okay. If we have a uh, yield strength of 100 megapascals with a ductile material, and we are using the von Mises criterion, okay, or do we expect failure? So what you do, take this equation, or take this equation, and we're going to go ahead and calculate the equivalent stresses. And these two should be equivalent. And it was when I was doing this problem that I realized I had made a mistake in the last session. Okay, um, I had calculated out the principal stresses incorrectly. But here they are correctly. Okay, so we draw a little more circle. We say that we have 45 squared plus 30 squared is equal to this quantity 54. I think I had 95 before, so it was way off. Okay, and this is uh, looking at sigma average as being 45, right? Because sigma x plus sigma y is um, is just 90, but then you have to divide by 2. And we have that, uh, this is the, the 15 here and 15 here. Uh, so that gives us the, um, uh, or no, so it's, sorry, it's, it's 30 here in the vertical direction. See, I have trouble. And it's, it's, uh, it's going to be... Um, just the, uh, yeah, the, the 45, right? I did it already. It's 30 this direction, 45 in this direction, okay, to get the R. So sigma 1, if I come out to this point, it's going to be R plus the 45, right? So that's like 99, 45 plus 54. And sigma 2 is this sigma average, 45 minus the 54. That's like minus 9. So now we plug in, if we want, sigma 1 and sigma 2 into this equation, right? Sigma 3 is equal to 0, and we can figure out an equivalent stress. So if we use the principal stresses, and then this long equation, pretty long, and substitute things in appropriately, we get 104 megapascals. If we look at just the state of original stress, which is given as sigma x equals 90 and tau xy is equal to 30 megapascals, we can plug those values directly in, bypassing the need to do the Mohr circle, and we can figure out that it's also equal to 104 megapascals. Okay? So that's kind of a quick example of how we can use the von Mises criterion to determine whether or not we expect to have failure. So, now, here we are going to have, uh, and I'm sorry, I made a mistake, but anyway, this is, uh, this is von Mises right here, is the, is the ellipse, okay, it's just, I'm um, covering it, that's the only thing, that's what this, this is what this is line is saying. Okay, so, Tresca versus von Mises. We know that Tresca, well, Tresca is maximum shear stress, okay, and that's using this diamond inside. You can look at session 22 for review if you like. Maximum distortion energy, okay, is given by this ellipse. This is actually that sigma y squared is equal to sigma 1 squared minus sigma 1 sigma 2 plus sigma 2 squared. Okay. So the one that has a larger envelope is actually 
the von Mises. Okay, it's this one. So it's like it's a little more complicated and gives us a little bit more room, right? So this is that equation that we were describing. Sigma y squared is equal to sigma 1 squared minus sigma 1, sigma 2 plus sigma 2 squared. Another thing that is kind of interesting when we plot these criterion or criteria is how they respond under pure shear. Okay, so maximum shear stress okay, uh, was kind of the name of the game for Tresca, right? The absolute maximum shear stress. And we know that if we have shear stress uh, or pure shear, okay, we can have a sigma 1 that's positive and a sigma 2 that's negative when we rotate by 45 degrees and we're looking at sigma 1 and sigma 2. So when we look at the line of pure shear or a line of pure shear, it's when sigma 1 is equal to minus, okay, sigma 2. So let me just write them off here. Okay. So this is what we draw as the line of pure shear. It has slope of minus 1. And, and Hibbler will write the x-axis as sigma 1 and the y-axis as sigma 2. And that's what we've typically done. This Wikipedia drawing has sigma 1 up here and sigma 2 here. It doesn't really matter okay, because it's symmetric. Okay, But this line of pure shear is, is interesting. Okay, So what it does is it tells us where we are going to have um, some interesting behavior. Okay, we have that um, the Tresca, this is actually wrong. I made a mistake here. Okay, this is not, it's just one. It's minus one half. Okay, this is not like this. It's one half. Okay. So the line of pure shear intersects the Tresca okay, formula at minus sigma 1 over 2, comma, sigma 2 over 2. Or over here, it's going to be positive sigma 1 over 2, comma, minus sigma 2 over 2. Okay. Von Mises is a little bit different. So now we have the intersection of this ellipse with this pure shear line. And what we get is that this intersection is square root of 3 over 3, okay, sigma 1, comma minus square root of 3 over 3, sigma 2. Okay, So we, we've now got a comparison. We, we know that well, Mises is actually a little more generous. Okay, It gives us a little more room. At certain points, though, it does predict the same. At these endpoints, okay, of the diamond. It does predict the same uh, stresses associated with failure, but it, it goes out and around a little bit more. So, um, oh, what did I do? I clicked on something. Okay. Hold on. There's a couple things. Okay. So here's an example. Once again, we're saying that the yield strength is 100 megapascals. And what is the safety factor under the depicted state of stress according to the Tresca criterion, and what is the safety factor according to the maximum distortion energy criterion? So what are we what are we going to do? We're going to say that we have our element under pure shear, sigma 1 is equal to 25 megapascals. And so sigma 2 is equal to minus 25 megapascals. That's going from this tau of, of 25 megapascals, right? That's, that's this is what we, we kind of just described a, a few minutes ago. So um, using Tresca criterion, okay, we draw pure shear, as, as we see here. And we say, OK, this is at 1 half sigma y, uh, comma, minus 1 half sigma y, like that. And we look at where these intersect. OK, it's going to intersect at uh, that, that's a point of intersection, right? So just plug in the numbers now for this point of intersection. That gives us 50, comma, minus 50. This is a material property okay, calculation. That intersection point is material based. We've done nothing with our loading at this point. Well, what's the safety factor though? Well, safety factor is going to be 
this intersection point, right? So look, I have sigma one is like 25 comma minus 25. So it's right here. And if I take the X or if I take the Y, right, along that pure shear line, I know that I can multiply, right? I can multiply safety factor times sigma one to get to this intersection, right? Which means I can take this intersection point, 50, the X component of it, and divide by the sigma one here, and I have a safety factor of two. Okay. What about if we look at maximum distortion energy criterion? Well, one way to kind of draw the ellipse is to specify those corner points, right, which are the same as what you have in Tresca. Okay, so I've kind of put them there. Of course, there's not really any corner. There's not really, there are not really, well, you could argue maybe there's, there's yeah, you could argue that there might be corners, but they're not sharp corners, right? It's smooth for this ellipse. Then draw an ellipse through these points. That's, I don't know, that's just how I do it. And then you have the pure shear line and it's intersecting. And this is a material property at this point. So we said on the previous slide that this intersection happens at square root of three, three sigma y, comma minus negative square root of three over three sigma y. You know, square root of three over three is about 0.577, right, which will come out here. So we say that the intersection is at 57.7 minus 57.7. That's taking this quantity times the yield strength, 100 megapascals. And what is our safety factor? Well, once again, we're at, say, this point here, which is 25 comma minus 25. So I take my 25, and I think about it in relation to what would happen if I were to exceed this number, right? So I say 57.7 divided by sigma 1, okay, this intersection point, that's going to give the safety factor. So like we were discussing before, von Mises or the maximum distortion energy criterion is a little bit more aggressive. So it gives a little bit more flexibility than the Tresca criterion. Okay? And the safety factor that we see here is evidence of that. It's higher when we're using von Mises than when we use Tresca. So just emphasizing this, Point Tresca versus maximum normal stress. Yes, we said that the maximum normal stress was actually more forgiving than the uh, Tresca criterion, pretty much because sigma ultimate is greater than sigma yield. Okay, so this is Tresca versus maximum normal stress. Now we're going to add, or we're going to we're going to go a little bit further, right? This is going to be versus more versus von Mises. Okay. And what do, what do we see here? We see that the more criterion, okay, is potentially the most generous, except for this, these corners here. I mean, it's going to depend on what uh, sigma ultimate and sigma uh, or sigma ultimate compressive and sigma ultimate tensile strengths might be, but um, no, I mean it's it's got to curve in. So it's it, but but it could be you could say it's more generous because you have this huge swath of area outside. Okay, it, you know the more criterion should be a little bit more accurate for situations where you have these uneven um, compressive and tensile strengths. What about von Mises? Where does von Mises go on this? Okay, well, this is more, sorry. Uh, where, where does, and a little bit more, right? Because then we also have this linear approximation that we use here. Okay, are we ready? Uh, let's see. Here we go. So now for von Mises, we put those pink little points down and we can draw our ellipse around here, and we can say that the maximum distortion energy, yes, is a little bit more forgiving or gives us a little bit more space to operate than the, the maximum shear stress theory, okay, but most likely it's going to be within 
the maximum normal stress or the uh, more criterion for brittle materials. But again, these are different, right? One is for brittle materials and one is for uh, ductile materials. So it's not like we're comparing apples and apples to each other. Okay. And, you know, one other thing just to point out is the maximum shear stress theory is more conservative and it's easy to do uh, on the back of the envelope. Maximum distortion energy is also not so hard to do on the back of the envelope, but it's a little bit more complicated. So, you know, if you need a quick and, and, and conservative answer, Tresca is not a bad way to go. Okay. Um, but if we're pushing the envelope a little bit with a ductile material, uh, it's, it's perfectly reasonable to use Volmeses. And that's what you'll see in, in many computer simulation packages. Right. So um, here is a question um, that may look a little bit familiar, this loading scenario. Okay. And the question is, what is the safety factor according to maximum distortion energy criterion? And then the next question, the last question for this session is also a little bit similar to what we've done in the past. And again, what is the safety factor according to the criterion of von Mises? All right. And that pretty much wraps us up for this session. What we've done <clears throat> is discuss safety factors in some amount of detail the more criterion for brittle materials, right, which is a little bit more accurate for brittle materials when you have uh, compressive uh, ultimate compressive strength and ultimate tensile strength that are, that are not the same. And we discussed the maximum distortion criterion for ductile materials. One VCs is the name, and also Maxwell, Hoover, and Hanke have been involved too. All right. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you have a great day.